Hey. <laughs> Wondering if it showed up. All right, while we're doing this here, turn to Philippians if you haven't already. We're going to start with uh, verse 2. Before we read, I want to say a couple of things. Number one, thank you for your, your comments. Um, honestly, I have been blessed by them. I mean, really, because it's, you know, you know, you could hear just about anything from people. You know, and I heard the Lord, and it's really, really good. So thank you very much. Also, uh, one phrase that I couldn't think of the right phrasing, but Shay just told it to me during the break, was we were talking about the coin, and uh, that the, the, the coin is the currency that God trades in. That's the, the phrase, the currency that God trades in. And, you know, you can have... You're going to have somebody come up to a counter uh, it, to buy something at uh, Whataburger and slap down, uh, you know, a bunch of pesos, you know, 10,000 pesos, and go, I want a hamburger, and you can keep the change. And it don't mean, <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> Carol gave the right look. I wish I had that one. What? what? Big deal. But, but there is a currency that God trades in that is related to this coin that I want to get into eventually. Um, Paul, uh, as he begins to move forward in this, he doesn't just throw himself into it. I mean, in verse 1, in a certain sense, in a, in a seed form, he literally presented the whole of the book of Philippians. But what he's going to do uh, from uh, 2 to 7 is, now, he's going to begin to talk about different relationships with God, or shall I put it like this, different ways of relating to God. Uh, so I, so I, I, I need to qualify that. Not, not necessarily different relationships, because that would make one think of this is my relationship with God, but rather different ways of relating to God. And I think probably all of us have related to him in one of these fashions or not. But he's, he's doing that because he's building towards something. So he's going to name off several different ways of relating to God, that he relates to God, that they relate to God, whatever. But he's going toward, uh, beginning with verse 7, but primarily moving from there, verse 8 on, where he is going to begin to present uh, in an ever-increasing manner the heart of what he feels God wanted to communicate to the Philippians and therefore to all of us because it was a letter to them. It's a book of the Bible to us. It's God's letter to us. And he wants them to catch that by contrasting it with different relationships. So as I read uh, verse 2 through 7, I would like for you to see if you can spot some of the different ways of relating to God that he's talking about here, and then I'll ask for a show of hands, okay? Beginning with verse 2. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, Always in every prayer of mine for you all, for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing that he who hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, even as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of my grace. <clears throat> all right. So hopefully, while we were going over those verses, you could see some different ways of relating to God that, that, that fall under the category of Christian activities or Christian ways of relating to God. Verse 1, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Comment, anybody, of a 
particular way of relating that it, verse 2 is describing there? Yes? In the beloved, is that okay? From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Someone else? Yes. God is our Father. Okay. Anyone else? A being a receiver, you you stand there receiving good. stuff that's, from God. That's good. Good point. Because that is, and and he gets into that a little more in another place too. But yes, Greg. He's the what? The fulfillment, okay. Jim? Paul's mentioned Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Lord Jesus Christ, just as uh, it was mentioned about him being a father. Uh, anybody else? Scott? I just see it as a, as a following the verse where he's talking about being in Christ, that it's, it's, this is a grace to you that um, relates to that being in him. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you what I saw from that. Uh, I said verse 2 gives no deep, I'm just talking about verse 2 now, just verse 2 all by itself, gives no deep or theological explanation for how this grace and peace comes about, but only that there is grace and peace for us from God our Father and also from the Lord Jesus Christ. So <clears throat> there is, uh, and again, I think you're all right and more, uh, but what I was saying is that there is this general way that we can relate to God, uh, whether, it, you know, it can be in a moment when we need grace or peace or whatever, or it can be a general um, relating that we know that we have this from God, <clears throat> that, that without all of the explanation, and again, verse 2 doesn't give you a lot, without all the explanation, it is simply telling you that as a believer, as a saint, as a Christian, whatever term you want to use for just strictly verse 2, there is grace and peace to be found from God. Okay? All right. Now, again, there's a reason why we're going to go down the, the road with each one of these is because... He's identifying different ways that they're probably familiar with in relating to God. And I would say probably most Christians are familiar with these ways. But he's going to present when he gets done a way that most probably don't relate. And he feels like, and it is the crux of his letter, that he feels like they need further introduction into Okay, you following that? So he's being very kind to him. He's saying, you know, there's this relation way, and it's God our Father, and there's this, you know. And he didn't, he didn't say, he, when he said God our Father, he didn't say love and tender compassion and, you know, sweet covering and blessing from God our Father. He didn't say that, did he? It, didn't, it doesn't even sound like that. It doesn't sound like that's where he was coming from. It sounds like... He's just communicating that there is grace and peace from God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, and he doesn't even try to explain how it's there. There's just that. You sort of following that? Okay, now verse 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Okay, what, it, what, what do you see there? Jim? There's, there's no condemnation. Okay. Yes. Fellowship. Good. No condemnation. Fellowship. I guess if there's no condemnation, you have fellowship. Yes. Oh, amen. Amen. Yeah. Okay. Someone else? And by the way, you know, it does, whatever responses you give, it doesn't really matter. Can can you believe, I'm asking you this, can you believe that each one of us could look at a scripture and actually all of us see something from God and yet it all be something different? I believe that's possible. Okay. So saying there's no condemnation, there's no condemnation in our responses or whatever. I mean, uh, you know, sometimes somebody will give a response and I'll go, well, okay, because I don't know. I don't know all things. They might have heard from God more than I have on what I saw. You know what I mean? So uh, it's not important. 
that you uh, understand everybody's comment. It's important that we try to get everything on the table so that we can see what the Lord really is trying to say here. Anybody else? Yeah, Deb? Yeah, uh, since I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, and normally God is like deity, but the scripture to me seems to have some type of an in endearment because he has a relationship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's more personal, it's so personal that he's relating um, the remembrance of those that he's in fellowship with, as in, not to the deity, but to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's more of an endearment, it seems to me, not to deity, um, before deity remembering you. You know, it's an endearing relationship. Oh my God, before deity. Yeah. You know. It's cute, if nothing else. Yes. Because it's like having ever been with someone and there's such an intimacy or a group of people of the Lord and their love for the Lord. And as you're sharing, if you look at scriptures and everything, they can just get so much of the fullness of the Lord. And there's such a joy there, a delight to share the Lord and just oh, like, you got this kind of, do you have that relationship too? Me too, but it's like, it's more like this is our exclusive love, but it's like sharing these attributes. So, um, Carolyn Allen and I one time were just sharing an actress, and it was just so delightful. It was like sitting down to a sumptuous meal at a buffet, and you just come away going, wow, that was so satisfying. You know, not just because the act of us just recounting his attributes and his character, but knowing that it says, henceforth, no we no man after the flesh, but we know it in Christ. So there's a, boy, there's just a, a union there in that sense. The union in Christ, but union with each other and sharing that joy. Greg? I was going to point out to you the as well because uh, verse 5, he says, uh, For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, and then in the other version, it's partnership. Mm -hmm. But the whole, what he's speaking of in verse 2, you can't have any of that unless you are in it. He says, and this is what I got from what Debbie was saying, that he says, my God, he's, it's personal, it's, it's, it's that, yeah, he's identifying there. Scott? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm actually jumping back to verse 2 here. Uh, just, uh -huh. yeah, go on, go on, go on, saying that the familiarity and the, the kind of intimacy that they're being addressed with, that the word peace there, I mean, it's shalom, it's a greeting. Greeting, you know, the Greek brothers, and you know, and uh, and I just thought, you know, I, I was reading through that, and it just occurred to me, he's saying, grace to you and, sh and shalom from God our Father. Amen. Mallory, just the first word, I thank, and the relation with God, God being thankful, and that's the word that I Spiritual, or at least I thought I was spiritual, but I went from meeting things to meeting to be more spiritual. You know, but it's, there's still that taking side of the relationship. But when you begin to thank God, there's a place of contentment and satisfaction. So instead of saying, I wish you guys would grow with Christ more, he is thankful. Even if they still have to grow with Christ more. I don't know, there's a relationship with more where he's able to label some kind of satisfaction. like verse 2 through particularly verse 6, as Paul sort of coming up with a list. And this is a list of ways of relating to God. And he wants to, he wants to sort of lay out the general thing that, in other words, there's nothing wrong with his list. But he wants to lay out sort of a general understanding of what people think Christianity is. And then he wants to show them what he thinks it is. Okay. So, uh, number one, uh, in verse two, that there is, and I guess uh, I'll put this out here, that there is grace and peace. I guess, or 
to us, for us, from, I'm sorry this is squeaking, God. Verse 2, there is grace and there is peace to us from God. And I, I can hear Paul saying, all Christians, do you agree? And they would go, yes, so far we're with you. We didn't really get verse 1 that much, but verse 2, we're good with. And then, and you're going to think I'm so, you know, not deep with that and then verse 2 but uh, that there is a relationship of oops, okay, verse 3 that there is a relationship of thanking God okay. again not real deep here in my explanations of this, but, I, but I'm basing this on what I see as Paul's purpose in even saying all of this, that at this point, he's not necessarily trying to, because he doesn't really get into a whole lot of theological stuff through these verses. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not like, well, let me, let me tell you what, you know, thanks is. Thanks is when you're dead and Christ is your life. <laughs> so he, doesn't, he doesn't even go there. Because I believe, and this, you know, again, this you don't have to believe what I believe, but I believe that what the Holy Spirit was showing me is that he is building a case for where he's going to go in verse 7 and 8, particularly verse 8, that he's building a case for different a list of the relationships and a list of the way that they would relate to God and that they would, you know, say, I've got that under my belt. I've got that settled. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm can I say it like this? I'm good with God. And he's going to say, well, that's fine, good. I'm glad you got that. I'm glad, I'm glad you, you fulfill the list. But now I want to talk to you about something. Now I want to get down with something. Okay, all right, verse uh, 4, always in every prayer of mine for you all making request with joy, okay, ways of relating to God. Mallory? Good, good. Um, that's pretty much what I said, and again, I know these are simple things, but it shows Paul as relating to God as one who can be prayed unto uh, in order to find answers. You see what I'm saying? I, I'm not seeing a deep theological thing behind that. I'm saying, uh, and just for simplicity, and so I don't have to squeak this board a whole lot, I'll just put praying, and of course that, that includes getting answers from God. And you know that these fellows believed in that. Did you have your hand up? Is that... uh, I, just, I just love how he adds um, with, with joy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that it's not this, I mean, without that, with joy phrase, you could maybe picture him like really groveling like, Right. Like, uh... Yeah, duty know, uh, or fear. Or, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But uh, uh, it's, it's a joyful thing. Well, and it sort of shows that even though he might be trying to hit different ways of relating to God, when he speaks of it, he can't help but include the reality of it in him. And, and you would understand how he would if that's... If he really knew the Lord in that way, you can't help but, you know, and many of you have mentioned little things like my God and, you know, things like that. Those are not insignificant. It's not, it, it, it speaks of the, the, many of the things that you've addressed and said there. And I don't want to make light of any of that because I believe it is truly uh, like um, these branches and green popping out of him and, you know, of life that he can't hide even if he's trying to just present one two three look that's good that's good check that's good check that's good however 
I want to talk to you now. And he takes the rest of the letter to do it. <laughs> one particular thing, one particular thing that he wants to nail down. Okay, um, verse uh, 5. Uh, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. And let's see. That one I didn't see as necessarily relating to God as much as relating to one another. Now, maybe someone else got something else as far as relating to God. But uh, thanking God for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. So I didn't include that because I felt like it was, it was uh, verse 4 and 5 kind of went together. Anybody have a comment or whatever? Well, yeah. First John says our fellowship is, in, yeah. is with the Father and with the Son. Right. Well, and again, though, interestingly enough, none of this is, yeah. is he really spelling out or going, now let me explain that to you. Son. Let me make that clear. He doesn't do that. He doesn't even, he doesn't go to the cross. He doesn't go, you know, to all the places that we could go, right? I mean, that's, and, and I agree. And, and I think Scott is nailing it on that point. I mean, clearly we could go there. John went there and he did it within the first couple of verses within John there. But there's a reason he's sort of withholding all of that. Yes. Um, it seems to me what he's doing is, you know, he's, he's not getting into any specifics, but it seems to me what he's doing is he's addressing uh, individuals that he knows that when he says this, it's a given what he's communicating. So he doesn't have to go into the large details. Right. They, they and, and you mentioned that actually in the last class, that you, you know, that thing of, of I write unto the saints who are in Christ that that he he felt like you know of course he's the he's the the founder of the church at Philippi and when I say that I, I'm not saying I, I'm I'm only saying this as the founder they have been pretty much introduced to Paul's way of teaching to Paul's emphasis to to where Paul would go when he, he talked about these sort of things. So, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, let's go to verse uh, 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Alright? Can you comment? Ways of relating to God. Mallory? Good. Someone else? Yes. That God is working in them. That's that's right. Absolutely. Great. Right. It's kind of mixed up with faith, but there's a he's, he's establishing a hope there that this is going to, this is going to happen because this is going to happen. Yeah. Um. I miss four was prayer, five fellowship, okay, six is what we're talking about right now. Um, but it's number four on the hip right here. I put, verse six finds Paul trusting in God. Faith, you know. Uh, it's just a little bit different wording, but don't you know, because he's really, tr he's not just faithing, you know, he's trusting God and for, like Jennifer said, for these people. Yeah, great. Uh, and I shared this with people before, but based on, on verse 6, you know, he, uh, I shared with people that one of the greatest, the greatest hope we have is that God's intent is for us to know him even more than we intend to know him. Yeah. So if it's his, his intention, it's hard for us to know him, and we'd be confident in that, that if we put the effort, so to speak, into it, we will know him. Mm -hmm. That's what he wants. Yes. 
John? Among you, it will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. I see that the sense of it as everyone was sharing their faith, but I see that um, that he who began a good work in you faith him to continue. So the, the work that he initiates, but he also completes it. So there is um, a sentence there, yes. an assurance there, again, of faith, but there's a sense of um, there's a solidness there, a stability, a security. Yeah. So uh, I don't know how much of that's getting recorded, but uh, Joan's saying that there's a, a solidness, a security with knowing that the one who has begun a work in you is going to complete it. And, um, you know, that's that's part of how we relate to God on a daily basis or, you know, as a instead of on a daily basis as a normal part of what we call the Christian life just like these other things are you following how I'm, I'm wording that and putting that did I see another hand over here or? okay um, I'll read what I, I put verse 6 finds Paul trusting in God that trust is found to be in the realm of believing that the God who has worked in the saints at Philippi will also continue unto its completion. The picture we get is that God was originally outside of them but now works within them. That same one, capital, that same one will stay involved until the work is manifested, described as the day of Jesus Christ. Yes. So Christ being the object in the letter and then the, in this part, the expectation. The expectation. Yeah. That is good. That's, that's well, well said and well thought out. I uh, appreciate that. Yes. Kind of humbling to be told that, or to know that you're not actually finished yet in, in a sense that it's not a bad thing that you're not complete yet, but it's just this open door of saying, okay, we're still going on in this. We're not, we're not there yet either. Do you know what I mean? I do. It's just this, it, it's a very, very sweet and heartfelt way to say to him, you're not complete yet. The Lord is taking you there, but it, it's a way of humbling them too with, without being, cruel about it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Or critical of me. Or self-righteous. Or self-righteous. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, well, let's address uh, what Amber was just saying a little bit, because this is uh, interesting wording here, um, <clears throat> that, uh, that he who hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And the wording lends itself, and, and you got to love the first part of that sentence, being confident of this very thing. You know, that's what I think Joan was trying to bring out, that confidence. But being confident that he, the speaking of God, who hath begun a good work in you. So what you're sort of seeing here is a work done by God on us, right? A work. All right. And it starts with, uh, I'll just say, begun. Begun. And then, what is the exact wording? Begun, a good work in you will perform it. Uh, I don't know what that word is in the Greek. Sorry? Perfect or complete? Perfect or complete. Okay, that's good. That's good. Yes? Yeah, I, I believe the quotation has to do with the fact that the work is his, it's not ours. So it goes back to um, that salvation is not by works, but by faith. And so therefore, there's nothing 
you know, uh, without him we can do nothing. So therefore, we have to be in this place. But it's not us that's going to perform for him and make him glad. It's by faith that he works this in us. And you can see how that should be a regular part of what we call uh, Christianity, or at least re relating to God in our Christianity. And I think those are along the lines of what Paul's trying to bring out. Deb? Yeah. Um, I was just kind of seeing it that it's, his confidence is very specific of the work that is in direct relationship to the day dawn, day dawn the day star arising in the hearts to then really the fullness of Christ, really seeing Jesus, that the good work That's good because that gets us back to what we're talking about here, and that is, okay, there is a, a, a work that the Lord is doing in us, and He began it, and but but there's still, as it were, a completion of it, or perfecting of it, or uh, as the King James says, a performing of it, and it says until, okay. So there's something that it's, in other words, it's not forever. It is, there's an end goal. All right, so let me ask you a few questions. If what we just said is true, then let's talk about the, the work of Christ and him crucified on Calvary. Is that a finished work? Okay, and I got, I'm getting a whole lot of nods Okay, then let me ask you this. It is? Well, if it's a finished work, how come it's not complete? If you, if you, I'm trying to follow this line right here. You see what I'm saying? Well, if it's finished, then it's finished. Then there ain't no begun and someday. There's only what's true in Christ at the cross, forever settled are you following me? Okay. Did you have your hand up? Yes, Jennifer. Well, the thought that came to my mind was it goes back to the last class of the difference between in and at. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Carolyn. Uh, like, uh, he gave them the land, but they still had to go in there and go in, yeah, possess it. You know, yeah. it was theirs. Yeah. But they still had it. Uh, very good. I don't know if that came across, but Carolyn Allen said, <laughs> let us turn the camera immediately toward her. And <clears throat> well, she was talking about going in and possessing it. That the, the, and here's what God said to him. I have given you the land. But then he said, go in and possess it. So here's the question. When he said that, was the land theirs? It was? Well, they weren't in it. Is it possible to buy a piece of land and not be in it? Yes. Is it possible for it to be yours? But you're not in it. I mean, I own a, a ranch down there, and I'm not in it, but I own it. <clears throat> I don't know how much longer. But <laughs> um, okay, so, so there is this important thing that we must realize that there is a balance of comprehension or you'll be confused. Right. Part of that balance is it's a finished work. The other part is you're growing into the reality of the finished work. So there is a work begun that must be perfected and that is found to be not that you're more Christian, that you're better, that you're more holy, that you're anything else. It is until the day of Jesus Christ, all right? So we need to define the day of Jesus Christ. What is the, uh, uh, we know that the finished work is at the cross and settled and done. We're just finding it out and learning to walk in it like Kevin was talking about, right? I mean, we're, see, it's not like we don't have it. It's like we don't know it. We don't know what we have. 
You know, it's like if uh, somebody went down to the bank and put, made a bank account for you and they put like $10 million in your bank account but they didn't tell you about it. And so every day you're scrape, scraping and, you know, uh, crying and, you know, going through junk, you know, and it's like we, we were at dinner tonight and Abigail said, oh, Papa, will you, will you take me over here to do so and so? And I said, would you like cheese with your wine? <clears throat> anyway, uh -huh. you know, we're going through all this junk because we're going through, you know, and we, and the deal is we don't have to go through all that. There, it's there. We just need to come to the knowledge of what's there. Well, it's better than $10 million. It's Christ. Yeah. It's better than the bank. You can, you can take the bank to Christ instead of you can take it to the bank. Is that just an American saying? Or? Okay. <laughs> well, it's a really nifty way that I just said that, but you'll never really fully. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one time I was preaching in Africa to the pygmies. When I got back, Jim said, well, how did it go? And I said, it all went over their head. <clears throat> that, that didn't happen. Okay, so there's a... Uh, there is this reality that there's an ongoing work by the Holy Spirit, not by God, yes. not by Jesus. He died on the cross and he finished it. The Holy Spirit has come to guide us into all truth that is already settled, okay? And the Bible says you're complete in him. Well, I'm, uh, you know, I, in I think that Colossians class that some of you guys are listening to that I... I think I had a class on, are we complete or not? I think that's the name of it. Well, are we complete or not? And I remember putting that class together because that was my big question. Because I would hear some times, or some people would say, it's a finished work, da 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 and don't look back, and da da you know, and don't say, you know, all this kind of junk. But somebody else would say, you know, we still need Jesus. We still, you know, the Holy Spirit's still working on us. I go, on, well, why is he working on us if it's done? Well, he's working on us to know what's done in Christ so that we know that it's done in us. Yes. Um, I was just thinking about, you know, the Lord is complete and he is in us, but the whole thing is understanding the relationship you have within Right. There, there's, and within him, too. Yes, there's a, a different relationship that you have to understand as you go along. And as you go along, then you'll appear more complete because you're identifying in that complete. He who is complete. Kind right. of like um, a wife might be married. You, you've done like this sort of example before, and he might have all the things in the world, you know, and she's relating to him as a servant to him and right. running around trying to scrape things by to get for him, and she's uh, maybe collecting cans, scrubbing pots to go maybe get him little baubles and trinkets, and all he wants to do is bring her to him and, right. you know, relate to her, and she's trying to do things for him. And he's like, well, that, that's sweet and all, but there's a relating that isn't happening. So it's, in that sense, it's incomplete, but the marriage happened. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I do, absolutely. All right, so, um, so we can see that, uh, and, and who was it? Somebody, someone, I think it was Kim said, well, it's, it's what we were talking about earlier with uh, in Christ or at Philippi. Was that you that said that or Jennifer? Absolutely, because in, in Christ, we are complete in him. Does it not say that in Colossians? You're complete in him. Well, when am I going to get in him? Well, you're already in him, right? So you're complete. But there's a problem. You're also at Philippi. <laughs> you're at new creation. You're here. And trust me, you don't seem complete to me. <laughs> seem like you got problems. Anyway, so, <laughs> so there is this, this reality that the Holy Spirit is not working on Christ. But he is, because you're his body. 
But he's not because Jesus is full and complete and doesn't need any work. Are you following the, we're, going, we're sort of going back and forth from at Philippi to in Christ. Jesus has finished the work and you're in union with the one who is complete. You got that? He's finished the work and you were the work. And that work was to make you one with him. You're not the work apart from him. The work is to get you one with him so that you live as one with him, so that your identity is Christ and in Christ and your resources are Christ and not you and what you can do for God and what you can do for the church and all this kind of stuff till, till all is swallowed up of Christ. Okay? Well, is that the case right now for you? Chris, is all swallowed up in Christ in your life? Well, me neither. So, you know, Paul is the one who told us we're complete in Christ in Colossians, didn't he? Said you in chapter two. But then he says, but I press towards the mark of the high calling of well, what are you pressing toward if you're complete, dude? We used to have a student that came to this Bible school and he he accepted the complete part. So do you remember who I'm talking about? This kid drove me nuts. He'd go, well, if we're complete, he said, I'm not even going to read my Bible. This is what he told me. I don't see any need to read the Bible. I'm complete. God did it. It's settled. I said, yeah, but you need to grow up into him in all things. Well, if it's complete, it's all settled. I said, is all your thought life, is all the way you live, is all that, you know, you're just all complete in him? And he says, yeah, well, God said it, so I guess I am. So that means whatever you think or say or do doesn't matter because you're complete. You're complete, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to tell you the word that follows that, Scott. Yeah, I, you know, I was just thinking about the, the, the term that he uses here until the day of Jesus Christ. And of course, ah, don't go there yet. We'll go there in just a second. Okay. <laughs> and I'll let you and I'll let you say what you're gonna say. But you've been around this message too long. No, not really. <laughs> not really. It's it's good sharing. Mallory? The thing about the whole uh, performing it until the day of Jesus Christ and the whole thing Well for a brief moment, there's two forms of that same verb. One is the Completing of it, like the actual completing of it, and one is we're working towards the completion. And that one is he's working towards completion, so we're right in process. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it's the same verb, but it's just a little bit of a change. That's kind of what I was looking up. But um, it's important to remember that God doesn't expect us to be completely in ourselves right now. Right. He actually delights in the performing of it, that he right. likes that, and that should bring condemnation all the time when we see that it's not all Christ in us yet. Like somehow it's supposed to be complete in us. And Something's wrong with us because it's not. The Lord delights and is, rejoices in the process. And I think, I know that with the condemnation mindset, it's hard to see that. So I think that that comes out here. Yeah. The Lord is delighting in working towards us and knows that it's not that He's really okay with that. Sure. So that's a big well, deal. because that's part of His plan. That's, yeah. that's why He sent the Holy Spirit. He sent Jesus to do a finished work. He sent the Holy Spirit to complete it in the explanation of it so that it manifests through us. And folks, there's a difference between completion and manifestation of completion. You got it? Think about it. Don't, I see hands, but don't anybody put them all down. Now. Think of this. There's a difference between completion and manifesting that completion. You can't manifest something that hadn't been worked in you, that the Holy Spirit hasn't clearly worked in you, and so, you know, there, so you're not complete in the completion. Notice my words. You're not complete in the completion. Is the completion done? Yes. Are you in that? Yes. Are you acting like it? No. Because the work of, the, the work of Christ on the cross was to bring about a finished work. That's where we look to find completion. And Mallory hit the nail on the head. The Bible never says we're complete in ourselves. It says you are complete in him. Okay, So that's, that's absolutely the truth. And uh, so anyway, we have, to, we have to look away 
from ourselves unto him to grow into completion. If you continually focus on your lack of completion, you'll never become complete because you're only changed into that same image from glory to glory, meaning the change being a manifest change that works in you. So, so I know we got a lot of hands, but I, I, I needed to, uh, I, wanna, I wanna talk about, I wanna finish this thing where it says, uh, until the day of Jesus Christ, because this is going to come up again later and pretty, pretty soon in Philippians. Um, it, it is saying that there is a, an until. What does until mean? Well, it means this is going to be the case until this takes place. And the specific of what it is saying is the day of Jesus Christ. Scott. Okay. <laughs> It's, it's interesting because, you know, everything in the Old Testament points to the day of the Lord, which, of course, is the cross. It is, that was, that was the day of the Lord, his death, burial, and resurrection. And so for it to say here the day of Jesus Christ, you know, of course, my commentary says, you know, Jesus' second coming or whatever, you right. know, of course. Um, I, I, I just think in Zephaniah, it really, it really says this well in Zephaniah 1.7. It says, be silent in the presence of the Lord God. For the day of the Lord is at hand, for the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He is an invite, invited guest. And the picture that the Lord gave me here, which really relates to this, is that, okay, the sacrifice has been made. Now, our job is to come eat it. And, um, and that's what the day of the Lord is for us, as we partake and truly... Uh, become one with that day. Okay, so one of the things that Scott's saying is that um, this, uh, this until the day of the Lord is not speaking about the second coming of Jesus, but is speaking about, shall I say it like this, not an event, but an eternal reality to take hold in those who are now living in time, but will then live in eternity. And I'm not talking about someday. I'm talking about eternal life now, which is Christ. I'm talking about, uh, because I think, that, I think there's a little difference between the day of the Lord and the day of Jesus Christ, because I think that Jesus Christ, when you put that and you search it out, and we don't have time to talk about it a lot, is speaking of him and his body. I believe that Jesus Christ is not a one-person thing. I believe the Christ is that which has become uh, one with him, but he is that. He is that, but it's him in his body. It's him in all of us. And so what I believe this to be mean is that there, there has begun a work, and that work was, the first act of that work was to put Christ in you. We call that salvation, don't we? You know, you got saved when Jesus came in. You didn't get, you know, and now there are, it just depends on your denomination, but you didn't get saved by praying a prayer. A lot of people pray prayers and don't get saved, you know, and they say, oh, Lord, you know, save me. Well, He's not going to save you by, uh, by saving you. He's going to save you by replacing you. And the whole point of receiving Jesus, we don't fully realize that when we pray that prayer. Oh, Jesus, come into my heart. And basically what we're asking for is a king to sit in the throne in there and to give me king wisdom. You know, something like that. Instead of come in as my life and, you know, enact the cross so that I know that I'm dead so that this until will be the full manifestation of Jesus in his body. That we will truly function as members of Christ and not members of the local church. You know what I mean when I say that. Not, not joined people to a local society. <laughs> you know, no, you know, you don't, you know, 
Your dedication is not to New Creation Fellowship. It's to Jesus. And if Jesus put you here and he added you here, then you stay committed to Jesus. But it is not a commitment to me or to this place. L listen, if it was that, I would have left a long time ago. Really? No, I'm telling you. You know? I mean, many a time I said, I don't need this stuff. You know? Uh, you know, and I would have been out the door. And I even thought it, and, you know, it was like in my heart having my bags packed, you know. And, you know, the father says, where are you going? Yeah. Really? Like, well, I'm just tired of this. And he said, you don't think, you know, I can hear Jesus. You don't think I was tired of it when I walked this earth? And the junk that I faced all the time? I didn't say, I'm tired of this, you know. I, I think I'm going to go back to God. You know? <laughs> but that's us, and that's, you know, that was me. And that, you know, as long as my commitment is here, and then somebody does something I don't like, well, then I don't have to stay. But if your commitment is to the Lord, and the Lord says, I put you here, and I didn't tell you to leave. You decided you wanted to leave. And, I, and I'm not, that, this is true of anywhere. Do you understand what I mean? I mean, if, if God didn't tell you to leave Arizona and come here and be part of this, then you got to go back. But if God told you to come here, then you got to stay committed to here until he tells you to leave. Does that make sense? I'm not, I'm just turning this all you sitting there, but it's, you, you understand. That's, that's our commitment. And it's not confined to walls and, and meeting times and stuff like that. It's a commitment to Christ's body. And this is where he said commit. Does that make sense? I mean, this is totally a thing of God. This has, this has nothing to do with organizations and meetings and, and all that kind of stuff. You know, uh, somebody says, well, why do we got to go to church or whatever? Well, that's where I'm going to find Jesus, with his body. He's in his body. He's going to move in the midst of his body. Where do I move? Well, I just float around out here. No, I move in my body. I mean, is that right or wrong? You know? So we say, well, you know, I mean, somebody said, well, well I, can, I, I can find Jesus. I was talking to him about the body and stuff. He said, I can find Jesus in, the, in a bar, in a pub or in a bar. And I said, yeah, but you know, you're probably more likely to meet him where he shows up. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah, you can find him anywhere, you know. You can sit in the tub of ice and find him. But that's not his normal place that he wants to show up. You know what I mean? He wants to show up where? In his body. And that's just, that's him. That's, he chose that. He's the one who made these physical bodies. He made the whole plan. He set it up and then he made the shadow. And he goes, you know, I don't, I know that you don't, you know. Uh, people, I've heard people about these out-of-body experiences. You know, yeah, I was just floating around the ceiling up there. I said, well, watch out for those ceiling fans, you know. <laughs> I'm terrible. I'm a real bad person to talk to on this stuff. But, but the, the point being, and, and, and if you had an out-of-body experience, that's fine. I'm not bad-mouthing anybody, my God. But the point is, is that you're not supposed to be out there. <laughs> you're not. You're supposed to be that makes you, you know, a disembodied spirit. Well, that's a spook. That's a, that's a, go you know what I mean? You're one of those scary things then. You know, no, I'm doing good. No, you're not. You're, you're a stinking ghost. <laughs> Get back in your body. <clears throat> well, that's what Jesus would say. Quit floating around and get in my body. But we're still claiming this when this, including ourselves, because I believe this, I didn't always believe this, but I believe that our bodies are also members of his body, and I've seen it in the scriptures. I didn't always see it, but even our bodies are members of his body. Now, you say, well, does that mean? No, it's beyond that. It's us. But that he counts you in your entirety as part of his body. And besides, where does he dwell? 
in you, in you would. In, he dwells in, you know, some capsule. No, he dw- you're the capsule. You're the earthen vessel. You're his body. All right, anyway, sorry. But this, this whole thing of till, until the day of Jesus Christ, I believe is that let's just let me just draw it like this. At the cross, there was and I'm just drawing a big circle here. There was a complete finished work. All that was necessary is done. Therefore, if you have received Jesus, listen carefully. You're never going to get any more Jesus than you got right now. When it comes to the the finished work, you can't. There is no way that you could get any more Jesus. He doesn't give you small doses. It's not like you're on drugs. Here, give you a little dose of this, and come back in two weeks, and see we can't fix you up again. Oh, more Jesus. No, you got the full dose when you got saved. All of him came in. He didn't like stick a hand in you and go, okay, you got my hand. You know? Right? You got Jesus in his entirety. You have the full Jesus. You don't walk in that, do you? Well, shame on you. <laughs> I don't either. We don't. We don't walk in that. But there's, it's, there's like a match that's trying to take place here where the two become one where we're the bride and he's the groom and he wants to bring it together. But he's, what he's bringing this, this bride into is who he already is, who already fully dwells in you. you. While Jesus doesn't dwell in you in part, you have the full Jesus. The fullness of the knowledge of Jesus doesn't yet dwell in you and, and in one sense won't. It'll dwell in the fullness of his body. Amen. Therefore, we'll always need one another. Can't get around that. You know, can't get around. So he's trying to match these two, but he's trying to match this this day of Jesus Christ to be Jesus Christ and us in union with him. The day, the dawn of it has, as Deb was sharing, has dawned on us. It talks about that in Peter. The day dawn and the day star arise in our hearts. When it's arisen in all of our hearts, till we all come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of what? Ourselves, the body, no, of Christ. Till we come to the measure, what measure? The measure of the Ten Commandments. No, the measure of, you know, the things that that new creation puts on us. Garbage, all of it, garbage. The measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Till we all come. When that happens, that's it. That's it. It's all come together. All right. Um, Now, next class, we're going to start into verse 7. And verse 7 begins to introduce Paul's whole different, uh, he he goes beyond the list, okay? And he's going to introduce a relating that he feels the church at Philippi has not done yet. And he wants to bring them into it. Everything that we've talked about in this class right here, has absolutely nothing to do with what I'm about to get into. I say absolutely nothing. It's not where we're going. We sort of got off on that because I could see little precious faces going, huh? You know, and I went, you know, we need to, we need to do some explaining here, you know. So we took the time to do that. It was good. I'm sure you got it all. But This we have not yet touched except in verse 1 what it is that God wants us to begin to launch out into. So next class we'll do that. Father, we ask you to keep our hearts tender. Lord, keep a a, uh, tension of faith at work in us 
as we're away from this class and the other classes. Keep us, Lord, where we're, we're just hungering and we want to know and we're walking around, Lord, just doing simple tasks, but in our heart we're saying, Lord, we want to know you. Jesus, let the Holy Spirit open my heart, my eyes, and, and the fullness of Christ and to manifest him. Lord, bring me to that day of Jesus Christ. Bring the whole body to that, Father. And Lord, just keep us not being Christian, not just doing the list, but entering into the life. And Lord, thank God for the list. Thank God for the different ways that we relate to you. And Paul didn't dis disavow them at all. But Father, that we may um, see what it is that you're trying to say to us in Philippians. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.